everybody. I am so happy you chose to join us once again for our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. Father, we thank you in advance. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are uh, still on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we will continue today with Romans 7.25. And again, all scripture will be the NIV unless otherwise stated. So Romans 7.25 says, <clears throat> Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And so if you recall from uh, last week, last study, uh, we asked the question, now what? Now that we've been delivered, now that we've been set free from the bondage of sin, now that we are on the Lord's side, how are we to live? We said that we are to be faith talking, faith walking, and faith acting followers of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 and 11 uh, through thir uh, 3 and 11 says clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So now the question is, how do I, as a believer who has been imputed with righteousness, how do I live by faith? To figure that out, we must first know what biblical faith is. The Holman Concise Bible Dictionary says a lot about faith. And, uh, and so I just pulled out some of what it says. I mean, there was a whole lot there. It says, faith is the acceptance of Christ's lordship, his God-given absolute authority. It is one's removal from sin and from all other religious allegiances. Faith is a personal relationship with God that determines the priorities of one's life. This relationship is one, one of love built on trust and dependence. It says faith is also Christianity in action. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says we walk by faith not by sight. Faith changes the standards and priorities of life. And faith is a shield against sin and evil in our lives. And you know if you're talking about faith, you have to mention Hebrews 11 and 1, which says, Now faith is being sure of, remember this is the NIV version, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The personal conviction of faith encourages the Christian to continue hoping for the fulfillment of God's promise. Faith, it, it, it causes us to continue to hope on the fulfillment of God's promise. Faith is then meant 
as a sort of foretaste of the hope for things. And finally, it says, faith is what we believe. It is Christianity itself. But primarily, it is the relationship we have with God through what Jesus accomplished in his death and resurrection. So then, the concept of faith is too big to just put in a one-liner that will cover all that faith is. Faith is too big for that. The American theologian, Dr. C.I. Schofield, says that faith, which does not impel to action, which does not result in a changed relationship to God and Christ, which does not work transformingly in life, is not biblical faith. So in other words, True biblical faith is not just a lot of words. It requires action. It requires change. It requires transformation. So after looking at how big faith is and how it affects everything about us, and because I'm a visual person, it, it just helps me to see what what it looks like. So I went to the Bible to find one of its many examples of people living out faith. And I know uh, we're used to and we could look at Abraham or Moses or Joshua or find perfect visuals uh, of men talking and walking and acting and living out faith. Or we could even go into the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which is referred to as the faith chapter. That's all great, but I just wasn't feeling it for this lesson. That didn't seem to be where I was being led. So I went in search for more or for something else. In the Bible, people were always amazed or astonished by the things said and did by Jesus. I mean, he's Jesus all by himself. He's amazing. But there are only two times that Jesus himself is amazed or astonished by something that was done. One of those times is he was astonished or amazed at the faith of the centurion. And the centurion is not even a Jew. And the other time that he was astonished or amazed is for the complete opposite, for the lack of faith of the people in his hometown. And these folks, we're Jewish. In today's lesson, we will focus on the one with the faith that amazed Jesus because we're, we're talking about walking by faith. We're, we're, we're saying that once we've been delivered, then it ought to show up in our walk and in our talk. And, and so today's lesson will focus on the one person in the Bible with faith that amazed Jesus. As we look at what practical faith looks like, how is faith lived out? If Jesus was astonished by this person's faith, I'd say it's something that should capture our attention. If Jesus was astonished, then I, I think that's, that in itself gives us a reason to look at the practicality of this man's faith. Now the recording uh, of the centurion uh, can be found in the Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 8 verses 5 through 13 and in Luke chapter 7 verses 1 through 11. 
without our study will come from the Gospel of Luke because Luke being a physician gives more details and I love details I should point out that even though Matthew's version sounds different it is the same story when you're reading Matthew's version it's, it sounds like the centurion himself came to Jesus but you have to think of it in terms of a diplomat speaking for a country and whatever the diplomat says he says it in the same manner or is or, or when the diplomat says it is the same as if the leader was actually there so here we go Luke the seventh chapter verse 1 through 11 since when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people he entered Capernaum there a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant when they came to Jesus they pleaded earnestly with him this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue so Jesus went with them he was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him Lord don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof that is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you but say the word and my servant will be healed for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes I say to my servant do this and he does it when Jesus heard this he was amazed or astonished at him and turning to the crowd following him he said I tell you I have not found such great faith even in Israel then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well what astonished Jesus was a Gentile with faith that showed up in his action after teaching the people in in chapter 6 Jesus entered into Capernaum now Capernaum became Jesus headquarters after he was rejected by his hometown of Nazareth one of the amazing things about Capernaum at least to me is that Capernaum and the people Capernaum and the people were rebuked by Jesus because of their lack of faith in, in Matthew the 11th chapter verses 20 through 24 Capernaum is included in Jesus' rebuke of the cities where most of his mighty works had been done and yet they did not believe nor did they repent think about it Capernaum is Jesus' headquarters which means that no matter where he goes he always come back to there it, it means that a lot of miracles are taking place there it means that if you need healing you really didn't have to follow Jesus around but you could just stay at his headquarters and catch him going or catch him coming it, it, it means that this town had major blessings just by the fact that Jesus chose to be there it, it would be like if Jesus chose your house physically as his headquarters your house would or could be blessed tremendously it, it's like Jesus standing at Mary and Martha's house the house was blessed the people in the house was blessed those who came were blessed but in this case instead of the people you would think because Jesus made his their their town 
or their city his headquarters, you would think that they would be a part of the uh, Hall of Faith. But instead, they are in the list of the rebukes. I found that amazing. I mean, I put it up there. I put it way up there with, with the people in Moses' time that had been bitten by snakes. And, and God told Moses to lift up the bronze snake and, and that those who looked up would live. And yet, some didn't. And we know they didn't because they died. <laughs> they were too stubborn to even do that. Kind of like our day and time. Millions around the world are dying. And, and we can just say in the United States, thousands are dying. Because they have been bitten by the coronavirus. And, and then a, a, a remedy has been made available. And so many are too stubborn to take it. So they continue to die. When a remedy has been given. Amazing. But I digress. So back to Capernaum. Capernaum was the home of Andrew and Peter. It, it was also a custom station where they collected taxes and whatnot, which is where Jesus called Matthew to leave his tax collecting to follow him. There was also a synagogue in Capernaum, which had been built by the Roman centurion in our text. That could mean that a station of Roman soldiers were nearby. They, they had a, 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 a port or, or uh, a base nearby. Now, I should point out that a centurion soldier or a centurion officer, uh, a, a centurion was an officer in the Roman government, army, and in command of around 100 foot soldiers. And I should also point out that the Jewish elders had little love for the Romans in general, but they had even, they cared even less for Roman soldiers. So in this account of the faith of the centurion, we find some things that are out of the norm, or at least, or at the very least, something that make you notice, something that make you go, hmm. First of all, we have a situation, and, and the situation is not uh, out of the norm, but the centurion's servant was sick and was about to die. That's not out of the norm. That's everyday stuff. You know, folk get sick and die no matter what status they're in. They could be rich or poor, they could be slaves or they could be free. Even the fact that his master highly valued the servant was not anything out of the norm. Even though the translation says servant, the man was probably his slave since he is called his master. Slavery during Jesus' time can in no way be compared to the institution of slavery that we're familiar with. During biblical times, it was a common thing. Uh, people would even sell themselves into slavery for different reasons. In fact, I read that it was not uncommon for slaves to have a better life than some of the free folk. Remember the prodigal son? When he says, I'm going back home because my father's servants or slaves, he said, they got it better than this. And then I also read in my studies that a lot of times the translation of servant should actually be slave but it's easier and less controversial in the translation to say servants than slave. So anyway, it, it, it was common for slaves or servants to become a part of the family, which this person, the, 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 the man that was sick, obviously was. Now we get some of the, now we get to some of the out of normal things. 
the fact that the centurion heard of Jesus. I would imagine that even if he had, even if you had your head under a rock, you couldn't help but to hear about Jesus. I would imagine that being a Gentile, his first hearing of Jesus was probably a casual hearing. You know, that's the stuff those Jews do and blah, blah, blah. You know how we do. We hear a lot about Jesus, but a lot of times it's just a casual hearing. It's, it's good for Sunday morning. It's good enough to say, I've been to church, but it doesn't cause us to act. It, it doesn't cause a difference in our lives. But here's the thing. When his servant became sick and was about to die, it became an active hearing. The same account in Matthew's gospel says that the servant was paralyzed and dreadfully tormented, meaning that the servant was in bad shape. And the fact that his master loved him means that the master was also tormented. You know, Anybody who has been by the bedside of a loved one that is suffering knows that it's, it's hard on you as well as the, the individual. It, it, it practically rips your heart out to see someone you love suffer and you can't help them. And Matthew's gospel says that the servant is paralyzed meaning that he can't do anything to help himself. Even something as simple as shifting his position. When you're suffering, to be able to shift around, just that can be a great comfort. But this man couldn't even do that. So, to be paralyzed and dreadfully tormented means that this man was suffering intensely. His pain was, it is described as dreadfully tormented. It means that he was suffering intensely. And it also means that we are out of time. So come back next time and until then, bye-bye. See you next week. Have a great week. Love you.